All right, here we are. I am in Minnesota now, so we just finished up in Wisconsin, and now we're here with John. John owns John's Custom Saws, and we're gonna do some chainsaw videos. So what are we doing right here, John? Well, what actually, we this one, you might recognize this guy. So this one's here for a restoration. Yeah, so this is one of my older 200 T's, and John here is like the master at restoring these 200s. So he's going to restore this, and we're going to sort of document the whole process so that if you want to try to do the same thing, you know, if you want to try to build your own 200 T, then you will be equipped after watching this video, hopefully, to try to take on that challenge. Yeah, it's one of those things that if you, if you want to hire somebody to do it, parts, for one, are really expensive. Uh, I I recommend you using uh, OEM parts only. The only aftermarket parts that I really like are like the uh, West Coast saw, uh, some of the Max Flow kits, stuff like that. Redbeard saws, the the cheap, you know, we call everybody calls them Chinese parts. Uh, those I have personally seen fail many times over and over, and you just hear the nightmare stories of it all the time that they don't last. And my theory is if you're going to take the time to do all the work, it's not necessarily the money, it's the time. You know, everybody's busy. You tear your own saw down, you get it all back together, and then you have a part failure, then you're starting all over. You're, ba you're back to square one and you all actually lost all that time and money. So OEM parts on 100% the way to go. What's a saw like this around a thousand bucks probably? They're hard to find too. They're hard to so find. Even if, you, yeah, exactly. even if you find one on eBay, it's probably gonna, I actually, I literally bought this saw off eBay actually. And um, the only thing I've done to it is I got this aftermarket muffler on there and then these three point dogs, but it's not running so good as it used to uh, back when I bought. I mean, if you're gonna buy one of these saws, it's gonna be used and beat up. So hopefully this video will help you to, you can restore your own 200. Cause these, these saws are a real gem. Um, and they're fun to run, but they haven't made them for what you think like 10 years now. Yeah. Probably. It's been a while. Yeah. And, and it, it, like you said, if you buy one off eBay, I tell people plan on sticking 500 into it. It's just the way it is. You, you buy them, they're beat up. They live with a tough life. They, that's what's, that's the condition you're going to get it in. Not many people really sell us a 200 T when it's run in mint and just absolutely in its prime. That's hard to find. So plan on doing some repairs. The carburetors go out in them all the time. Uh, that's one you're gonna have to replace probably. They're about $90. The cylinder, uh, the top end is about 180 around there. And you're gonna wanna do bearings and seals, highly recommended. So just plan on sticking four to 500 bucks into it minimum. They're an awesome saw, but they, they get beat on. It's just, it's life. Yeah, for sure. Well, cool. Well, uh, let's start this teardown. Well, yeah, let's see what you got. I mean, usually there's a few different surprises, but hopefully uh, it ain't too bad. So another one of the parts that, uh, this is actually in really good shape, but these melt out all the time, these uh, clutch covers. And that's just because they, the way the exhaust is on this. And you actually, oh yeah, you have the West Coast port, so we're gonna pull that off there. That is a big upgrade for the 200T. They do not have uh, adequate exhaust flow. So basically, you said that this one wasn't running the best? Yeah, it's probably some car issues. And we'll have to find out. Usually the cylinders are, are pretty rough in these. One thing is put the saw in the start position when you're gonna tear the carburetor out. It's kind of a nice tip and then you're gonna to wanna to take this. Why do you do that? Uh, because it pulls, it gives a little tension on the throttle linkage back there. And then it keeps this out of the way. So like this would be, this would be basically down here. So when you pull that out, it pulls that out of the way. And then also it's gonna give tension on that linkage. You'll see when I pull it out, there's gonna be a throttle linkage back there. When the fuel line is on, it's up here. Yeah. And you cannot, you can't pull the carburetor out. Okay. So people do that a lot. They're trying to rip that carb out of there and they're wondering why it won't come out. That's as far as you need to go on that part. And then the carburetor will, will pull out. And if it's coming out with any difficulty, you have something basically hooked up still. We're going to be doing a lot of part replacement on this one. So if you are going to try to save as many parts as possible, you know, just be careful with the stuff. Never rip anything out of a saw. It should come out relatively easily. If it's not, you're, you're missing something. You have a bolt still in or, or something that's hanging it on. Out here. And that's about it for the the intake group. Everything uh -huh. is all out, all the linkages. This linkage stays in. We're gonna take the handle off. The handle, 
uh, is another one of the parts that some people are fighting, but it's actually very easy to get off if you just take take all the bolts out. Where do you, they, get, where do you get all the parts? The parts I get, uh, I have a steel dealer, really local here. Yeah. It just I can go there and get them. Uh, otherwise, I, I hate to say it because people might not agree, eBay. eBay yeah. has really good parts. Sometimes I can get them cheaper on eBay. They're OEM. They're unopened. They're they're legit. They're the real deal. So, And this is another common part that you want to watch for. Yours is really good. This is the twist lock. So this is a metal lock. And this post in the middle of here and this metal lock, you always got to keep an eye on the condition of these. The post and metal lock, if you have any kind of trouble locking this filter on, if this is hard to lock, you're twisting on it or it's bent, do not bend it back, replace it. Because when this sits on your saw, I've seen this probably about a dozen times, this post will either bust loose or one of these tabs will bust off, goes directly into your cylinder. Instantly uh, destroyed. Like uh, okay. it's, uh, it's kind of a design it. flaw. Yeah, so if you have those two parts either are bent or they're hard to hard to lock that filter down, just replace them. So the rest of this, you wanna disconnect this little uh, ground wire right here. So the, you can get right through the side cover right here. This is just a bolt. Uh, that's off. These two bolts, there's one back here and one here that go through the antivide mounts. And then this one right here, another antivide mount in the bottom. And then these little magnetic trays, I, I really like these. I usually keep two of them. I have the other ones tied up, but keep all your, you know, especially if you don't do this a lot, keep all your parts you know, separated handle parts, intake group parts, you know what I mean? It just keeps everything uh, sorted out. And when this comes off, you have to work this intake manifold in. So I'll come off like that. And then you're gonna have an impulse line that is gonna connect to that little, uh, okay. that little part right there. And don't be afraid to put a little bit of pressure on that intake manifold, they are tough. Uh, you, it, you know, don't try to baby it. Don't stab it with a screwdriver and try to work it through. Okay. I've found the best is uh, a pliers, the, the flat pliers. Uh, we are replacing this one. That's a replaced part for me 100% of the time because they go bad. Yeah, is but, that the boot that you're Yeah, that, that boot. And uh, these they'll make these flat pliers that don't have any serrations on them. Oh. It's for grabbing rubber right. parts oh, like that. Oh, okay. I so if I was trying to save there. it, I you know, I would use something like that. But if you're trying to save it, don't use a screwdriver and poke at it. And, uh, you know, just be careful with anything that's got sharp edges on it. Then you're going to have this uh, wire right here pulled right off. A lot of people have a really hard time taking these handles off. They rip this wire out of it. Uh, they take the side off. You don't need to do that. If your high idle works, which it does on this, that will go out a lot. So if that is in good condition, do not take anything apart. Just leave it. This clamp that goes on this intake manifold. There's no good way to say it. You have to put a little bit of pressure on it and work it out. But once you get the edges popped out, don't push too hard on one edge. So like you know, so I'm working this out slowly and you can get under here if you're very careful and push up. Now we're getting it. And then work it out with your fingers if you have to. And then once I get an edge up, I like to hold that other edge and get that out. This can be kind of a, a pain to get out. What's that part called? That is just a clamp. They just call it a clamp. Uh, they might call it a spacer, but that holds tension because there's no clamp. They're like a hose clamp style. Right. Okay. This is what holds. And that's another reason why I replace this every time. Yeah. That, that over the years has been holding this rubber boot on there. Yeah. And you know what I mean? How plastic works or rubber. It, it's going to kind of crush it down a little bit. And you'll notice when it goes back on, it's not as tight. When, when you replace this, it, it'll give a really tight seal. We're all gonna pressure and back test the saw when we're done, uh, agreed? <laughs> That's the biggest thing. Do not do all this work and skip out on a pressure back test. Absolutely okay. bad idea. So that's that will check the boot, the bearings, the seals, or not the bearings, the seals, uh, all your lines, basically everything that's gonna keep the, the air inside the saw, the air out of the saw and the, what you need inside of it in the saw. Here's another one to replace. This is the impulse hose. And this is going to go to the crankcase, and then it attaches on the handle where we saw it before. We had to pull this off of the handle to remove it. It is. It uses the, crank, uh, the crankcase pressure to run the fuel pump diaphragm inside the carburetor. Simple terminology, this is critical to fuel delivery. So okay. if, if this hose gets uh, 
a tear in it or if it gets uh it'll get like what they call like dry rot from fuel so if if this isn't sealing correctly on the handle or on the crankcase or there's a tear you're, you're gonna have issues the simple things are to check fuel filter fuel vent fuel line impulse hose and and intake boot it's all rubber parts basically that you know they have a hard time it's it's not it's not they can't make it out of steel or hard plastic it is what it is so yeah just simple parts that could be an easy fix. Yours, thankfully, isn't horribly filthy like some of the, I won't mention names, but some of them that come in. But I totally get it, you know. I like to have the clean, pretty saw, but that's not always the real world. So for the 200T, you are gonna need a T20 Torx, a T27 Torx, a eight millimeter uh, on a, basically a T-handle or a socket on any, any kind of eight millimeter. And you're gonna need, if you pull the flywheel, which we're gonna do, a 13 millimeter. And that will also take the clutch side off, or the clutch off, 13 millimeter. So your recoil is actually not bad. A lot of uh, yeah. ropes, decently long, you need rope, but these get, uh, these, like I said, these saws live a tough life. They get so much stuff packed inside of them, they'll literally stop working, but yeah, you're, you're looking good. Oh, hey buddy. <laughs> Hey, buddy. You don't know where the kids are? What are you, the grown up of the house? They're doing school in yeah, the motorhome. Yeah, they're at home. school. You didn't have school today. They're yeah, going to be they, home. They and... do school in the motorhome. Yeah, we're doing a movie out here. You need daddy to help you out with something? What kind of fuel and mix do you use? Uh, I use synthetic mix, and I just get the mixers, you know, the five-gallon mixers. Oh, yep. Yeah, you're, they're looking really good. We'll have the whole okay. cylinder off, and we'll get a good look at okay. it. Okay. Exhaust side is going to be the side that usually, if you're going to have any any issues that's going to be the side that is going to okay. going to show more but so for a while we were at east side we were um it was kind of a pain in the butt because we had to drive far away to this gas station we were using ethanol free gas for yep. a long time that's what everybody said was really good and uh we never noticed like any difference of just using the other stuff at the pump yeah you won't using... notice the difference much in performance but what you are going to notice is uh wear and tear on your your gaskets and diaphragms inside your carburetor your fuel lines Ethanol is yeah. terrible for that stuff. It is the worst stuff for uh, any of your rubber gaskets, yeah. uh, stuff like that. It, it just, it rots them away. It's really strange. Yeah, fuel is very important. Uh, it, it's it's one of the, when I did repairs for years, 90%, no joke, of the problems I saw were fuel related and uh, the rest are usually maintenance. Very okay. rare that a saw just fails. So how did you even get it started with the saw, the saw work stuff? Oh yeah, so uh, basically I... After doing uh, dirt bikes is what I started on. I got into being a mechanic at a steel dealership and they sold both steel and Husky actually. So I did all the training through them. Uh, I got my certification for uh, gold level steel, gold level Husky, and then a lot of various small engines. But that's where I started working on chainsaws almost exclusively. Like a lot of uh, different mechanics, they, didn't, uh, they don't like to work on the small stuff. It frustrates them and I get it. Uh, I'm the same way with cars. I don't like working on cars, but I've always had a love for two strokes and once I saw I got into saws it was like that's it like there is just a great little piece of equipment to, to work on I like to take the the muffler out first and if you are just taking the muffler out by itself you can get it out without tearing the whole saw down you just take this one cover out and it's gonna be hooked in back there and then there will be two bolts on the bottom this might be a farmer tech muffler it is actually I actually like so I don't really like aftermarket parts but I like the farmer tech muffler better oh, really? believe it or not yeah the steel mufflers still uh no it's, it's just really new this saw is probably not ported I could tell that already because usually this muffler port will get opened up on the yeah on the muffler itself these are always broke uh cracked this bottom part cracks off uh it's just a piece that's always bad. And then now you can, I don't know if you can see with your phone, but there is a little opening back in down that, and that exhaust comes out this tiny little port and then pushes around that curve, goes out and then out this way. That's why the, the muffler mods on these wake these saws up so much. It's like the size of two pencil erasers, the exhaust port on these mufflers. But yeah, this is, that's a, that's a good part. Okay, nice. And then, so, and then now we'll be able to, let me take the tank off be easier for the camera and you can uh you can look at the cylinder and see fingers crossed what we got to work with here and then there's two bolts on the bottom 
And I like this snap-on bit driver, not endorsing any tools, but it locks. I can unlock everything like, or, you know, break bolts loose like that. So some of them, if you have just like a impact driver and the bolt is a little bit stuck, you won't know it right away. You just wrap on that thing and then you start, yeah. you start wrecking stuff. And then this fuel tank will come right off. And believe it or not, this is actually pretty clean. This, uh, most of these I get in are just absolutely filthy. So this might be an aftermarket cylinder, but. I'm surprised it's in such good shape. I, this is literally the eBay saw I bought three years ago and never ran it. Yeah, a no, lot. I think this is a, actually an OEM cylinder and it's just in that good shape. Oh my gosh, this thing is looking great, Jacob. That is in. pretty good. So uh, we'll have to pop the cylinder off, but. It's looking pretty good. That's looking pretty good. That's, it's that's actually crazy. pretty rare. So the clutch, this is going to get arguments from people. I do not use a piston stop when I take my clutches off. Uh, if you if you don't like that that's okay but i've seen so much damage to pistons from using a piston stop or people will shove rope uh, in their in their exhaust port when you take the clutch off you have to stop the the saw from turning over you can hold the flywheel all also works but wrenching on this thing with like a big ratchet i've seen more problems with that so these are reverse thread look how easy that was no problem so and I think you have a busted, yeah, you have a busted clutch spring. Uh, that, so was your saw not when it was idling and the chain was always spinning or something? Yeah. That's the problem. Yep. Yeah. It's a really common uh, part failure too. So your one spring is busted off. Now, to, when the saw idles with a bad clutch, you can't get to idle down because this wants to expand. So when the, right. when the, you know, when the saw is running, the clutch is turning inside of this, but this is what drives your chain. Right, and so if the spring is broken, yep, it I actually grab. Yeah, and I knew when I sent this to you that that spring was broken, actually, because yeah. So imagine this thing; it holds it tight, but if it's spinning and you got a broken spring, then it's grabbing this. So my my chain was constantly spinning. Yep, that's, yeah, that's yeah. So there we go. But we're gonna we're gonna take care of all that. But that is how I take a clutch off. So this is where the rubber meets the road as far as the the issues in these two hundred Ts. A lot of them, when they go bad, it is it is the seals and the bearings. And we will get a look at one right here. Let me pop this oil pump off. This will be your oil pump. Oh. The bolts that have the basically the area where you put the torques in, they'll you see how that's all full of mm -hmm. sawdust and stuff. A lot of them, it's a good idea just to take something, wear your safety glasses, everybody, blow these things out. It's just a lot of them, like before you go through them, just kind of blow them out like that. Uh, otherwise you round them out like I almost did on that one bolt one of these Yeah, it's this one like you, you're out and yeah. start to round out well It's because it's packed with right packed with material and it's gonna be tougher to Get a good hold on it There we go, so this is your oil pump and so this saw has had some sort of repair or something done to it I can tell because there's Loctite on the oil pump bolts Which is I mean it's no big deal and that is your seal right here. They are OEM, which is a good sign. I do not like the aftermarket seals. They're just not good parts. So OEM seals. OEM seals for sure. And then when you put them in, I will go over that one in the time, but you uh, wanna use this special tool, which is basically just a, a, a cylinder that goes over your crankshaft and it pushes them in. But those look pretty good, but we're gonna do the pressure and back test. Let's do it on this cylinder the way it is right now and we'll pressure back test this saw make sure that it's it's airtight okay. and then uh, we're gonna be taking the cylinder off and doing some uh, cylinder porting and uh, machining but let's check it and see where we're at so this 13 millimeter this is not reverse thread this is just uh, standard thread they're not threaded on so uh, they're held on basically just by by friction I don't know what you would call that it's wedged on and pressure fit and to get it off, you have to break that loose and you don't want to be pounding on the crankshaft, obviously. So this is basically an extended nut that goes on the crankshaft. You tighten it all the way down, finger tight. I back yeah. it off about a half a turn. And then I have found the old carpenter claw hammer uh, yeah. works the best because you want something that's gonna kind of, you know, you get the ring off of a yeah. You, like a dead blow hammer for some reason doesn't work the best and you don't want to leave it on your bench because you want it to be able to vibrate. And usually take a couple, oh, one came right off. 
yeah, I made this, but you can buy this tool. If you don't have one, you can use a punch. And if you, I mean, some people would even use a hammer, but uh, again, you don't want to damage these threads. That crankshaft is a pretty vital part. Yeah. Okay. So you could, you could put this nut on where it was flat with the crankshaft. Yeah. And then, if, and then if you're pounding on it, it's not really gonna, you know, mess with the threads. It's not really gonna hurt anything. It's probably not recommended, but if I didn't have this tool, I would use a punch. I'd put a punch down in the center there, keep the nut on it so it doesn't swell the threads out. Give it a good tap or two or three or five. You know, sometimes when you do a video, everything goes, it's hard to get everything off and sometimes it goes smooth. So hopefully this is one of them smooth, smooth deals. So there we go, your flywheel's off. Well, I can tell you've done this like a thousand, you know, a million times. Yeah, these 200s are, you get a little bit of a, a method to them because even even mechanics, sometimes they don't, they don't like, like I got a good friend mechanic that hates these things. I'm not saying I'm some sort of crazy expert on all these saws, but the 200T, I've done enough. I would recommend following the method that I just did. Okay. It's just, it's the easiest way to get them apart. Your ignition coil is OEM. That's another good part. They're always packed with uh, debris like that. So we'll clean all that out, but uh, this is going to get all cleaned up. So actually we're going to take the coil off. If you are just doing a rebuild and repairs and stuff like that, you wouldn't need to take the ignition coil off. This is, uh, we talk about this too when we get to it, but this is another part that can be very frustrating for people is the spark plug lead goes through the crankcase and this this wire goes up into the handle here. They have to route through the crankcase. It's a pain, uh, but I have a couple tricks for that. When we get to it, these ignition coils are threaded on so you can just basically unthread it from the spark plug lead because we're going to be doing some pretty cool uh, restoration and painting, all that fancy stuff that I do here. So we got to get everything off of this thing. Flywheel keyway, I would take that off right away. These things are a pain to get off. There we go. So very little part. So here's another common fail point in these saws, the antivide mount. This one is shot. How do you know it's shot? It's, it's, uh, Just it's ugly? No, it's, it's hanging off. Oh. So that's shot. Yeah. Okay. Two points. And then this is just going to pull right through the crankcase. Oh, okay. And getting it in is a little tougher, so that's why I would say make sure... Uh, you don't pull that out unless you're do, you know, doing what we're doing, restoring or splitting the case. Yeah. You, you can get it back through there. It's just kind of a pain. You take out these little bumper spikes. What's that thing do? It basically just keeps the chain from hitting the crankcase and it doesn't, uh -huh. it's plastic so it doesn't wreck the chain. Right, okay. That makes sense. And I will say this, you know, if a million people see this on YouTube, uh, I, I'm not doing the 200 T's anymore. This is a favor for Jacob, and uh, I just, uh, I mean, I, the stuff I'm doing now is what, what I want to stick with. These used saws are just, uh, I just got away from it, so I don't, unfortunately, have anybody to recommend you to. A uh, service center, really. Yeah. For cert for repairs, you just take it to a certified, a certified, that's very important, uh, service center. Well, that's what we're trying to do in this video, kind of show people. Yeah, show to, people how, you how can do it yourself. Because John used to do a ton of these. And now, you know, we're trying to make a video trying to show exactly how you can do it yourself. Yeah, it's not too tough if you, you know, you do a million of them like me, but I get it that, you, you know, you're not going to, the average person isn't going to be tearing these things down all the time. Yeah. And it can be a little tricky, um, but we're, we're we're down to the bare bones now. I mean, we're down there. So we're going to get the pressure back tester out okay. and uh, I'll show you what you need to seal it up and we're going to do the pressure back okay. test. He's so busy. He's got so many people requesting. He doesn't do used saws anymore. He doesn't do Huskies. He just does brand new steel chainsaws. He does really good work. When he did the Screaming Eagle for me, that was a... What did I do? What did I do Screaming Eagle's up here, actually, next to the nitrous saw. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, he, I, I, That's so cool that you reached out to me before I was well-known in any fashion. I was uh, just started on Instagram, and Jacob reached out, and... Uh, one of the saw done and did him a saw and the, the thing's still running. So yeah, yeah, he's all the time. Yeah, you had almost no followers. No, <laughs> back yeah, then. I, and this saw was all used and everything. And yeah, it's so cool it's, that it's running great for you. So it's crazy how there you, you go. You've That's just sweet. blown up since then. Yeah, it happened overnight. Uh, I was posting on Instagram and I didn't know that you were supposed to use hashtags. And uh, <laughs> the guy that got me onto Instagram uh, showed me about it. Was like, hey man, you got to put hashtags on it. And then, then it started to finally take off, but all of a sudden I had like 5,000 followers. I was like, what is going on here? 
and then now I, I'm not sure where I'm at now, but uh, I think like seventeen thousand last I checked. No way, really? I think so. Wow, that's yeah, that's crazy to me, but. But that was Colm Champ. That was Colm, Colm Champ, in yeah. Ireland. He made the he made that logo for John. He made my logo as well. Yeah. And so it's kind of cool. Everybody's kind of connected. This would not be happening right now. Jacob wouldn't be in my shop. Uh, it, it would just be a different deal. I'd be at the service center still, 100%. Yeah. Any tree guys watching this, you got to get on Instagram, man. It's cool. It's such a cool community. That's yeah. how I met Rion. That's how I met you. So, yeah, we've all met on Instagram. Uh, yeah. It's you know, a great some, way to network. Some of the other apps are brutal that for stuff. They're so critical. They're so, um, it's like, it's like they're mean. And, yeah. And Instagram. We all stay away from Facebook. Right? Yeah. I got on yeah. Instagram and I was blown away how, how awesome everybody was. They were, uh, they would actually give you a compliment, which I was like, let's go. <laughs> I was like, almost like in shock that someone would give you a compliment. And it's been like that ever since I've had, I've met so many cool people. Uh, yeah. It's been a blessing. Big time. Okay, so now we're set up. We kind of cleared the bench off. We're gonna do the pressure back test. I'm gonna show it on the the saw, crankcase, and cylinder before we do uh, the porting and all that. Just to see where it's at, and then maybe show if there is an air leak. I can demonstrate it. Uh, I am thinking if I was a betting man, I would think that it is airtight just because of the condition of the cylinder. Um, when you get an air leak, you're, uh, very common, you're gonna have a uh, cylinder where they suck in air, they get hot. You'll uh, start to score your cylinder, bearings go bad, air leaks are uh, are your worst enemy on these saws. This is the tool I use for it. This is not some crazy expensive tool. I believe you can get them for under $100. It's going to come with uh, different uh, fittings. To... What's it called? It's This is a Mighty Vac, and I, th I think it's just called a pressure vac tester. I have had this thing for probably... 10 okay. years maybe. To rebuild a uh, OEM cylinder, do a rebuild, you're looking at 300 bucks probably, close to it in parts, depending on the saw. Yeah. And a lot of your time, everybody's time is worth money. Yeah. It takes a long time to do it. To skip this step is is like playing Russian roulette. It, right. it really is. So that's why it's so important. You need to leave your spark plug in. Okay. Uh, and you need to block off anything that you can, air can escape. So this one has an impulse hose, the intake boot, and the exhaust port. So you can just cut a piece of uh, hard rubber, whatever you'd want to call that. And you do want to make sure that it covers this completely and it's somewhat cleaned off when you put it on. Yeah, it's just you gonna just hold. Got, okay. Okay. I don't tighten them down real tight at first. If I need to, I'll tighten them down more. So that is the exhaust side. The spark plug okay. is left in, so that's gonna seal that off. And then, when you put this on, you do need to put this clamp that we talked about before. Yeah. So that's going to go back on just to to seal the boot. Okay. So that's all sealed. And then I just use these uh, rubber stopper of some sort. Um, they do stay in there pretty well, actually. This is like a, a high temp silicone kind of base material, but it's completely blocked off except for the impulse hose because you need to, you need to be able to get air in and out of it. So yeah. Hopefully this thing seals up. Okay. Perfect. So I do pressure first. Do it either way though. And do seven pounds. Okay, so it's pretty airtight. I was actually kind of hoping it would leak a little bit so I could demonstrate, but if you, this is soapy water. Yeah. A lot of soap. And that's where it's going to leak from? Yeah, a lot of times leak. is these crank seals. This is why I tell people don't ever reuse a spark plug. If you take a spark plug out, you have to replace it. Yep, there you go. So your spark plug is leaking a little bit. Okay. So these have a crush washer on them. Even yeah. If you, like when I do brand new saws, I yeah. replace the spark plug. Okay. You, it, if you take you, it off. Yeah, when you use it. that crush washer up, it's, it's bad. So... Yeah, good you to know. would not believe how many spark plugs I've seen that leak. So that's why you don't ever reuse a spark plug. Then okay. obviously we're gonna we would do pressure. It goes pressure this way. Usually they don't they don't leak nearly as bad in vacuum, the vacuum pressure because it kind of sucks everything in. So that's the pressure vac test in a nutshell. And then now we'll take it apart and check out the cylinder. There we go. Now. Fingers crossed. I'm thinking it's going to be pretty good. You never know until you get it off. Oh, that's looking pretty good. There's scoring and there's scuffing. Scuffing is normal. Uh, you don't want to see any metal transfer or yeah. scoring. 
So I can still see, slightly see what they call cross hatching. So there are, I don't know if that shows up, the lines in your cylinder that go that go this way yeah. are, are normal, it's, it's cross hatching. And the lines that go up and down are gonna be your scuffing and scoring. Now, okay. a brand new saw that you just got that you did a, a day's worth of work, you know, running it. Yeah. It's going to have scuffing on it. Okay. And that's normal. But you don't want to see deep gouges. If you get really hot, you start to, you'll get a metal transfer that is basically coming from your piston. It'll coat the lining. Okay. If it, I mean, we're talking extreme heat, but yeah. that's, that's what air leaks do. Okay. I mean, if you want the absolute best just replace it okay. you know they're yeah. they're like 180 dollars or so at least replace the rings that's a that's a must you know okay. what i mean i wouldn't go yeah. this far do the cylinder and then not replace the rings okay that's that's kind of crazy okay the, but the piston and the cylinder if you can save them i see more power to you don't ever right. reuse the base gasket people will say that you know they don't like the paper style base gaskets versus like the newer saws have metal gaskets so they We'll use a gasket maker. If you do that, I recommend Durco HT. Uh, it's the best gasket maker ever. Okay. Because a lot of gasket makers, people don't realize this, they're not high heat and they're not fuel resistant. Okay. So if you use a gasket maker that's not fuel resistant, it'll seal up right away, but for, you know, how long? And then it's going to start to break down. Now I'm going to actually hone your old cylinder with the, with the cylinder hone here. And it's going to put new cross hatching in it and also expose any, if there was any actual scoring, it would expose that and then make me look like I don't know what I'm talking about. So, so when you do, uh, you, I do not recommend the hones that it, they'll have three like jaws on them that go out and they're on springs and they have stones on them. Yeah. I don't like those style hones. I use only this style. I wish I knew what brand it was in the name. I've just had them for a really long time and I actually like them when they get a little worn. So, but when you do hone low speed on a drill, and you want to go in and out like this when you run it. Then go in reverse. Okay. And see if that was if that was scored, you would you would see clear marks. So I just did that lightly just to make sure that we're good. Yeah. And yeah, we are good. You you could reuse the cylinder. We'll talk about it if you want to just put a new one on it. Oh, also you want to check. This is an old ring. You want to do this with a new ring, but we'll check ring end gap. So for taking these rings off, this is how I do it. And I just clip my nails, so it's going to be hard. God dang it, I can't get a hold of this thing. I don't know if there is a special tool for this, but there we go. I got it. So don't ever grab a piston ring with a pliers. If you grab onto it with the pliers, you'll, you could snap it really easily. Don't use screwdrivers, picks. Uh, for some reason, metal. On, on these rings, you can damage them. But if you can get a grip of them with your fingernails, like this one, the other ring isn't in the way, so it's easy to grab. I just pull them apart a little bit and take them off. Okay. Same with putting them on. You just kind of expand it and put it on. Okay. So don't ever grab them with pliers. And then for ring end gap, you are going to check by putting the ring. I mean, this one's super good, actually. You, I take up the piston so you get it squared up. So we know it's perfectly level in the cylinder. And then we are checking the gap in the end of that ring, which is, it's pretty good, but we're putting new rings in. Uh, I'll show with the new ring if you want, and it'll be basically tight. Okay. But you don't want a big gap in there. Uh, it basically, that's gonna tell you the cylinder wear. So this cylinder has very little wear on it, if any, and we have no scoring. We were airtight. Where that's the checklist cool. basically. So a lot of it is so obvious with cylinders and pistons. If you have damage, it's big divot in it or, you know, big chip missing off of it. Or sometimes these rings will catch a port. Have you ever heard of someone say, oh, I hung a ring or whatever? Yeah. That's because this it's going up and down and it hits this lip. And when you get cylinders that are worn, you have big a lot of ring end gap or a lot of heat. You'll catch that ring on there and that thing is you know, moving, those, these cylinders, these pistons are moving and it catches that and it's just instantly devastation. Okay. <laughs> so that's why some of these cylinders and pistons, you see them, they look like they are just, you know, destroyed. Well, when you're 
going 12, 13, 14,000 RPMs. It doesn't take long. Yeah. And they're soft metal. The cylinder lining is hard, but the, the piston itself is aluminum. Uh, the combustion chamber, all that, this is just aluminum. But the lining is a, a hard metal and the rings. That's why also when you, kind of off topic, but when you warm a saw up, you want to let it run for like 45 seconds, 30 seconds. Like you did this morning when you started your 661, that was about perfect. Let it run a little bit, flip the throttle, because this piston is going to swell uh, because it's a softer metal. The hard metals, the cylinder lining and rings and all that stuff, they don't really expand and contract much, but the, the piston, the aluminum does. You always start your saws like that? Warm yeah, them up. I always Very give, important. I always, I always give them a minute. And your saw still, you've had it for how long? And it's, it's still running like a champ. Yeah, maybe three years, maybe two, at least two years, probably three years. There you go. Uh, Gordy so, built me that saw back before he got all famous. Too. Dude, that thing runs. I just ran it a little bit out there. That's the first time I've actually got to run one of Gordy's saws. And he's like... Uh, oh, really? Yeah, he's like a mentor. I mean... That's the first time I've ever ran one. I just thought oh, that's that. crazy. Yeah, he built me that before he had his website or anything. He was still working his nine to five job when he built that for me. God, that's crazy. The, the man does and it runs work. great still. Yeah, and you've had it for that long. That's a ported saw. So there you go. That's the the huge rumor that ported saws burn up right away. That has nothing to do with uh, porting. It has to do with the man that did it. You've had that a ported saw for that many years, and I, I think just three ran years. It. Like that run, thing like, runs like a champ, and that thing has ran a lot. Strong, still really strong. Yeah. So there you go, warming it up. I watched Jacob do. That. I didn't talk to him before he did it, and it would have been like uh, exactly how I would have wanted someone to warm up a saw if I had sold him one. Oh, cool. So yeah, this thing might be kind of a pain to get out. So we're not reusing this because it leaks, but. Yep, and you got the right plug. I like that. Some of these plugs, I think I saved one that had. So some of these, uh, even though it's a BPMR7A, the terminal on the end here will unscrew. They're threaded on. You don't want that, especially for M-Tronic saws, even though this isn't M-Tronic, but even though it's still a BPMR7A, you want to look for that. You don't want one that unscrews. So make sure you have the right spark plug, and that's where they go. Every single time you use a spark plug, they go in the trash. Do not reuse them. Okay. Same with the rings. We're not reusing rings. Those go in the trash. Actually, I'll put them in the metal bin later. Just trying to show off. Didn't work. Didn't work out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're ready now to do the done. cylinder porting. So I'll so set up the degree cool. wheel. Okay. And we're, we'll get ready for it. So I'm just running it out and taking off material. About halfway. 